This week on the podcast, we're lucky enough for our guest to be our very own Timbo, a.k.a. Timothy, a.k.a. Dynamic Shoulders. <laughs> is it a guest? A.k.a. Is it a, head of handstands. Is it just that one of the, one of the hosts gets to answer a few more questions than normal? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's a guest. Maybe. For, and for for and for those that are uh, super intelligent with this, they will know that that means that that by veto uh, makes me uh, a question master, which is always an exciting occasion. High, high <laughs> big shoes to fill, Jacko, because after the, the last question master we had in, in me, <laughs> he, <coughs> he did all right. <laughs> he did okay. Feedback's been good. Uh, before we get cracking into talking all things shoulders. Um, we just want to mention and just remind you, uh, some of you have already signed up because you're very excited about getting started, kicking off your January in style. Um, 11th of January, the next um, online course that we're doing, six weeks bodyweight basics. So if you are into uh, your training, you want to be able, all of this is done completely at home. You don't need any equipment or anything at all. But six weeks of bodyweight basics with me and Coach Owen starting on the 11th of January on Tuesday evenings um you can join those six weeks uh live you get to watch them back on replay if you miss one or if you can't make any of them you can watch them all on replay and then all of the different exercise and workouts are available you lifetime access to all the like short tutorials of each of those broken down um and it's 125 quid if you are not a member of the scorecard so it's 99 quid if you are a member and if you're a vip check your emails because you've got a very special Ooh. offer to make it just 75 quid um yeah, that starts, Pace Limited starts 11th of January and they're already starting to book up. So if you're keen, look for the link in the show notes and we look forward to seeing you there to kicking let's, off January in style. Let's not jump on the New Year's resolution bandwagon just yet, but what I'm going to say, because it applies any time <laughs> of the year, is what something which makes habits more effective or habits stick is accountability. Mm. So having something to turn up to for six weeks could be enough to put a big seismic shift in how you go about your training. So for that alone and the awesome content and coaching, well, that's an absolute steal. Brilliant. Uh, so uh, let's get into this week's podcast talking all about shoulders. Now, this is where it's awkward because normally the guest doesn't have to say roll the jingle, but I, I've, I'm doubling up today, multitasking, roll the jingle. Listen, players, <laughs> you're listening to the Movement, Strength and Play podcast by the School of Calisthenics. Here are your hosts, Tim and Jacko. So, Timbo, um, let's let's set the scene. Those that you, uh, those that follow you um, on Instagram, those that don't, like, why, why aren't you following also Tim's private account on in Instagram? I'll put the links in the show notes for those. Um but let's set, let's set, let's set the scene because um, a lot of people have heard us talk about the story of like why we got into calisthenics and you know uh, a lot of the time people will probably think that we had very similar starting points to some degree that we did but the the onus and the reason for um, for starting actually was quite different in that I was very much bored of lifting weights having finished playing rugby and was looking for something a bit new and a bit exciting to get my sort of uh, love of training back. Um, and there may have may have been a slight element of that for you, but it was a very different um, reasoning and a little bit more of a. I like to think of it as a scientific experiment. Um, but what? Just give us, just set the tone for people, uh, set the scene of why did you actually try to learn to do a handstand in the first place, and then we'll start to unpick some of the benefits for people. Yeah, I'll keep this relatively short so that the people that heard this story before aren't reaching for the forward button on their on their podcast. <laughs> um, a listening device and those that haven't heard it basically i had a history of shoulder dislocations from playing rugby so as I, i've said before i don't actually know i stopped counting how many times i dislocated my shoulder first time was when i was 20 years old at university and then that kind of continued through to about 2008 9 i think so like um, more than 10 times do you think uh what that would it? probably be a fair guess about 10 yeah. I think um, it's, it used to go out when I, uh, and I could, I'd make a tackle. Um, well, I'd try and make a tackle. Um, <laughs> miss, a ta miss a tackle. Miss a tackle. Dislocate yeah. my shoulder and hit the floor. <laughs> probably, pop it back in. Probably I stuck my arm out too far and didn't get my body behind it was probably part of the problem. Um, I wasn't great at tackling. Um, so yeah, I dislocate my shoulder and then hit the ground and then the force of the elbow hitting the floor would then actually just pop it back in. So often I would dislocate and it would go back in. So I'd walk off the pitch being like, oh, shoulder's really sore, I just dislocated it. But then 
that was kind of first round. I had surgery, um, and then I went off scuba diving um, to be an instructor for a few years, and sort of got into weight training while I was away. Strengthened a lot of things up and did quite a lot of shoulder work during that time because I knew it was a weak area for me. So I, I really enjoyed shoulders and tricep type work because it's kind of felt like I was securing something which was a was a weakness. And then when I came back from, from traveling, I started tra- playing rugby again, but I'd almost suddenly I got a load more muscle bulk. So then when I started dislocating again, the shoulder then stayed out. So it, often right. it would- So would, just, so the, the strengthening work that you'd done didn't actually seem to, that didn't do anything to stop you dislocating it. No, and, and the caveat to that was that because I continued to dislocate, what had happened was the original repair had failed. So when they went into the second surgery, I was like lying. They did gave me a regional block in my neck, so you're awake. So they've numbed my whole arm. So I could, and then they showed me what they were doing on the TV screen. So I was like lying there watching, and the guy sticks the camera into my shoulder, and then you could see the sutures from the original repair, like just floating around. So where there was like a tear in the labrum, imagine like you've got um, a saucer and a teacup on top of it. The saucer is like the scapula, and you've got this really small lip where the teacup sits and that holds the, sh- the head of the, ho- the shoulder or the humerus in place that there's a there's basically a tear in the labrum which is that lip so imagine like there's a section of the of the teacup which hasn't got a lip on it anymore so if the teacup goes in that space it's going to fall over it's got no yeah. security and that so provides that's... some suction presumably yeah right? so it basically just seats it so the, the the labrum in your on your scapula deepens the socket by 50 percent, and this thing is tiny as it mm. is so it's really not a very because you've got this trade-off between mobility and stability of the shoulder, um, you can't have, like, where you've got in a hip, like, super deep kind of, like, socket and lots of ligamentous tissue to hold it in place. We still get lots of mo- movement, but not like we do in the yeah. shoulder. Um, so, yeah, I basically got a tear in the labrum. So imagine when the shoulder went into a difficult position or into a certain position and then force was applied, it would just slip out of the socket, and that's how it would dislocate. So the strengthening work then was basically had served a purpose in, in some ways, but once I dislocated, what it felt like is everything just tightened up and spasmed and just like held the shoulder out. And there was a couple of occasions where physios were trying to put it back in, and they were really struggling because I kind of got quite a lot of upper body strength at that point. But I really had to consciously just switch off and relax so that they could put the shoulder back into place. Um, so that happened, and then I had my last surgery. I, I was trying to recall the dates. I think it was like 20, 20, 10, 29, 2009, 2010, I think, something around that. There's early days of where I started my strength and conditioning career. Um, and then I actually dislocated again snowboard in 2014. So I don't know whether my shoulder is still got some or has now got a structural issue whether that uh, the second repair has failed did i tear the labrum again because it's quite common when the shoulder dislocates if you do it enough you're going to get some kind of like structural deformation of the of the joint whether that's the humeral head you get a dint in it so now it doesn't look the right shape it doesn't fit as well and then that makes it easier for it to slip out of place or we get a tear of some of like the softer uh, connective tissues and stuff that are, are, are holding it in place um, yeah. So that's kind of the, that's the back to the back story to it, um, and I started originally to try and learn to handstand because I'd done so much physio, and it never got me to a place where I was comfortable to start throwing weights overhead or uh, like to go back on the rugby pitch because they get you to a point of being pain free, moving well, and then it's like right off you go, and that for me was like there was a big gap then between what I actually could do at that stage and where I actually felt I had confidence because you, otherwise you go. Okay, finish with physio. What was I doing before? Bench press and rugby. I'll just go back to doing those things, which like were probably part of the root cause of the issue in the first place. Um, so calisthenics and learning to handstand was kind of twofold. One, I was by the sea in, in just outside of Cape Town. And I wanted to look at the ocean while I was training. So I thought I'm going to do some body weight stuff. And the second thing was, if I can do a handstand, then I'll have some confidence that my shoulder's stable. That for me felt like a logical progression based on having done all the band work, all the kind of like low level stability board balance exercises and the single arm scaptions and none of it really had kind of gone, this feels like a joint which you can go and chuck 90 kilos through for example, yeah. which is what I wanted to do as a, as a, as a emerging strength and conditioning coach. Yeah. And the, um, I guess that handstand position where the arms, um, overhead is, is like, your, is a, is a, is a vulnerable position for you to 
to uh, like arm reached out yeah. to uh, to dislocate and, and just talking about whether some people you know some people listen to this will have um, will have, have experienced a dislocation themselves and be like cringing every time you, you hear you say that other people will be not sure what exactly what that might be like and as you said like so, sometimes you were describing it there as like oh it'd pop out and then it'd pop back in but then when I had a bit more muscle it was a bit difficult like I have uh, witnessed um physio trying to put um a shoulder back into to what someone that i was playing with and there was two of us one holding the gas and air <laughs> <laughs> whilst whilst this uh, huge bloke of a man shout out to to rupert cooper who's now who's now actually um a uh, chef mm-hmm. and has been the the head chef at our retreats like he is a bit yeah you know, he big is a dude. big 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 strong um relatively as a chef lovely guy but as a rugby player like angry uh, <laughs> tough guy and he was screaming like a baby it was probably the worst thing i've ever witnessed uh, of just seeing someone in pain like it's not it's not a nice thing um and in terms of having this unique ability to dislocate your shoulder lots of times um to do with hypermobility you're not like where do you, have you ever has, has anyone actually said oh you're hypermobile or is there even a test to do they is there like a, a a mark is there anything where they can go oh yeah you the measuring x that means you're hypermobile or not or is it just like oh you've got loads of range like wh- where 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 because some people will be yeah. you know we get people at work and go oh my elbow does this but then and so but, oh but then on my but this other body part of me doesn't seem to be quite so hypermobile yeah, I, I don't. To be honest, it's a good question. Yes, as far as I understand it, from a physio perspective, there are tests for hypermobility. Um, I've never been diagnosed, if that's the right word, as hypermobile, um, because if you look at like my, often it was like we do a lot of work with swimmers. You see mm-hmm. swimmers and they're super bendy elbows, um, and sometimes it'll be in people's like knees, particularly where you'll see them like that bow leg. The other test that they do is that sometimes they'll take the wrist and like how far have you got, which like right kind of range of bending the thumb down towards the forearm. What's the um, opposite of hypermobile? Uh, I've got that. <laughs> 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 I want to say hypertonicity, which is no, like it'll over, be high, it'll be hypo mobile, hypo mobile, hypo yeah, mobile. Of course, um, stupid. So yeah, so that was like, so yeah, I've never, no one's ever said that to me, but I have like a, a good ability to just generally move. Um, so I've kind of put it down to, I've got laxity in my capsules, or my connective tissue is probably quite stretchy. So I dislocated my hip when I was twelve years old. Um, that shouldn't have happened. Like that's an that's an injury that normally either happens in a car crash when the the, the bonnet shunts into the the, the, the knee and, and pushes the hip back, or it happens to old ladies. Not many twelve year old active. So it dislocated players. out of the back. No, it came forwards. It came that's forward. even more kind of like unusual so it came out at 90 degrees of where it should have been so i've got the x-ray where you've got the the, the feet the, the 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 pelvis and then my hip sitting at 90 degrees of where it should have been mm. um so th- that shouldn't have happened and, it, and all it was was someone fell on top of me and i think on top of the ball which kind of pressed into my hip so it kind of just like popped it um and my shoulder 12 we probably weigh about 40 kilos it's not like a high that's not even a high yeah i was training with the age group above so the guy was 12 months was older than me. He was 42 kilos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he was a big, he was a big 12 year old. He was a big 12 year old. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so that, that happened. Um, and then with my shoulders. How ex- painful was that by the way? Yeah. Horrendous. <laughs> so the story about that. Very Cause you don't happened. have bad injury. Like I played rugby from the age of like eight and you just don't have bad injuries mm. until you get to a certain age. Cause it's just the collisions as a, so to have that at like 12, I don't know, I would imagine like everyone, you know, how did the, other people react? You know, there's some things that you can just like traumatic life events that you just don't forget. So I, I can picture the part, the pitch that we were playing on at Mellish Rugby Club. <clears throat> I, I remember like, I remember the falling as part of the mall. I remember the people who were there. What were you doing in a mall, Tim? That's the I, biggest I know, I question. Never have done that. Um, and then I remember like lying on, like rolling over my back and being in like really serious pain. And then... They Got brought out turtle. the stretcher, Don't which was like chicken wire and two scaffolding poles. <laughs> <laughs> you know it is, at like your local rugby club. So they carried me into the clubhouse and the paramedics arrived. And this paramedic was like hell-bent on, he's like, I need you to straighten your leg so I can put a splint on it. And I was like, for about five, ten minutes, he's trying to get me to straighten my leg. And in hindsight, now you go, you can't straighten your leg if your leg isn't attached <laughs> to your body. <laughs> like, 
So we were like, they gave me like. So he didn't know it was dislocated? No, he didn't know. Because uh, it wasn't like sticking out at 90 degrees, it was kind of at a funny angle. Mm. But, um, but I like basically managed to like move my ankle, my, my, I extended my, well, my heel slightly, and that was enough. And he goes, let's just go to hospital. So they put me in the, in, the ta- in the ambulance and gave me some gas in there. We got there and they x rayed it, and they were like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so my, the claim to fame, I think it was Prince Charles once like dislocated his shoulder or popped his collarbone or something like playing polo the surgeon that did that put my hip back together again so touched by hands that have touched oh. royalty wow i know well, i've actually heard charles on an in, on a on a podcast i can't remember whose podcast was, and he was saying uh, the surgeon that sorted mm. my shoulder out was the one that had <laughs> yeah. sorted tim 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 from school car uh, <laughs> hip out so that was 12. Um, and my shoulders are just like i just generally had quite a lot of laxity so if it, like, from an anatomical perspective like the capsule that sits around the shoulder its job is basically to tighten up at end ranges so when you go overhead the tight the, the, the static structure it's one of the part of the static structural or static stabilization systems of the shoulder so if you start to go into outer ranges or you move there quite quickly the capsule will do a certain amount of tightening to try and stop that that happening so for people and when to we say of, when we say capsule tim what for people what what is what is the capsule? What is it made of? What is it? Is it is it muscle? Is it what is it? Yeah, so think of it as like connective tissue. So it'll be that's probably that's a relatively big term, but like lots of collagen, lots of fibrous kind of connective tissue, fascial connections, that sort of stuff. So it's like, and, and the capsule also around the shoulder has got some. They call they are ligaments, but they're actually that like, they're not like separate bands of ligaments. They are like thickenings of the capsule. Effectively, you can kind of like. Um, cut the capsule away and leave the ligaments as they are but it's, it's there's not a lot going on there really in terms no. of that, that does actually it, static stabilization and does it have like contractile properties like is it or is yes it a, yeah. yeah to a point because like it, it's when it sort of starts to lengthen you'll get some level but you're not going to get it's not like a muscle it doesn't contract no. like a muscle but it will tighten in certain positions so to give people like a visual representation if you th- Think about when you've seen someone who's a good Olympic weightlifter, like maybe at, at like a higher level than the Olympics or whatever. When they throw the bar into a snatch position, it looks like that shoulder just hits a dead stop. Like it goes boom. That's the end of the range. The bar's kind of roughly overhead, um, and I can just hold that shape. When I throw a snatch, I basically have to decelerate the weight to put it into a good position because if I don't, that force going backwards would take the shoulder too far. You just go over. to a full. Yeah, so it goes. It ends up too far behind my body. Then you've got a lot of weight pulling you in a really bad yeah. angle. Um, so that's kind of like that's that's that is what I think the issue is. Is the laxity of the tissue of the capsule, and that's what the, the the surgeons said when they did my hip as well. Is like my, my capsules were quite loose. I've got quite a lot of of mobility there, which is a gift and a curse, right? So I'm 41 years old, and I'll sit in ass to grass without doing, and I do zero mobility work pretty much, apart from some foam rolling, a little bit of kind of like movement prep so for what i do as a strength and conditioning coach my physiological makeup serves me perfectly for for being able to jump in front of a group of people and just be able to go right here's a great quality movement i can do that but for my own training when i'm trying to load structures it's a bit of a problem Mm. yeah yeah okay so um so uh, as we as we, you sort of you touched on it goes a little bit more like where do we where's where have you taken it from uh people well, the the whole concept of um did what i was supposed to do to stop the shoulder disc game when i went back into stuff like it would it, you know it, it didn't fix it the the handstand principle um you know was something you you test and tried out have you ever since being able to do a decent handstand have you ever dislocated it since then and then and then also what is what's uh, you know i've seen it and uh, some people that follow you individually will see that um the level of detail that you've now gone into around the shoulder and it's not you know so i guess this question is more like so would um if you were to start again it's 2016 again would you just jump would you know you basically just jump straight into your handstand would you have like done stuff to build into that like where does that where does that sit in your mind having learned over the last what six years good question so my current reflections around this are training was progressive um because i didn't have any option for it to be any any other way so i started learning to handstand 
from a frog stand position. So I spent a significant amount of time because I had no kind of like skills in handstands. Mm. It wasn't that I really could just kick up and then risk that end range position. Yeah. So uh, this is kind of like where, and this shapes a lot of how we teach handstands, but I basically learned it from a frog stand and I thought I'm just going to push from a frog stand into a handstand position if I can do that. Yeah. Um, rather than worrying about that kind of the real, like just kicking up and trying to hold it. Yeah, so, so that's, that's a good, I've not really necessarily thought about this from the dislocation point of view, that you're, we're saying that that, that end position was like the goal, but equally the most uh, worrying to dislocate but you'd never actually really went there until you'd built up the the strength, the control, and and, and the confidence that it, that it was okay. Yeah, I mean, like I was doing handstand push-ups at the same time as well, but if you think about that shape, you've still got an opportunity to stay out of yeah. the yeah. end ranges. So you, you can kind of like, arc, I was probably arching my back at that time. And, and, and your feet were on the it. wall. Like exactly, that makes yeah. you, the, the, it takes the stability demand out of it. And, and the other thing is it's interesting around like closed kinetic chain handstand things is if you think about like where the force is coming from. So my shoulder would probably dislocate down and out of the socket forwards. Whereas right. in a handstand, I'm keeping a relative yeah. amount of force upwards. So I'm Push probably the holding the shoulder in the middle or towards the top of the socket. Even when I come down, the force is still kind of like going to yeah. be sitting. I'm not allowing that shoulder to drop. And then when, when the elbow comes down, I'm actually in a safer position because I'm not less likely to kind of now dislocate through the bottom of the socket mm. effectively. So I'd very much kind of like just explored some different positions, but because I was so bad, I had to earn the right to go and play at the level that I can now play at. And it was like, I remember going from a frog stand position, which is in almost closer push up in terms of shoulder angle. And then as I was like leaning forwards and pushing out, I was probably pushing back at 45 degrees, which is like an inclined chest press which again is not the kind of like real risk position for me. So I'd spent quite a lot of time doing that stuff until I started playing like truly overhead into some of the stuff that we do now, like flags. Um, but that was probably the, the handstand was probably the less worrying. The, the more worrying one was when we first started trying to learn to, to do flags um, <laughs> at H3, like putting my hand on that bar. I was like, this is, this now feels exactly like the position that I don't like. Um, yeah, the force is a bit different on that bottom shoulder in a flag. And the isn't force it? it's, it's is really now pushing like it. into the bottom <laughs> of the socket. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. pushing my shoulder downwards, like towards the body, which was a place that I didn't like. Um, but I think I actually I ran a workshop at the, at the weekend, just gone, and we had a similar sort of question. And I, and it was it, it wasn't any there wasn't at that time a specific strategy of I'm doing this and I know the exercises that I now need to do to go and yeah. solve this shoulder issue that I've got. Yeah, I could probably, experimenting. Yeah, I could program that for now for somebody and go, these are the progressions that I'll play with. Um, at that time, it was like us playing around in positions that we just sort of were exploring and experimenting with, as you say, and, and it just happened that I think over that time, I did enough to develop the neuromuscular control to be able to now kind of stabilize the, the shoulder and and that's the crux of it right like when it comes down to it if you've got a shoulder which has got is liable to dislocation and, and you've got like any, le any level of feeling of instability probably comes down to dynamic stability like how much neuromuscular control or how much uh, ability have you got to keep the humerus in the center of the socket and if you think about you've got big muscles sitting on the outside pecs and lats and anterior deltoids these guys like well they want to play and produce force if they are overpowering the stabilization systems, that means that those big muscles can start to pull the humeral head around the socket. Now that causes a problem because the margin for error in the shoulder is so small. Whereas if you are take that a level deeper and we've got rotator cuff and we've got um, some of the, any of the, the sort of periscapular muscles and muscles which attach onto the scapula itself and take those big players out of the equation. Now we've just got an articulation and a synchronicity of these muscles to hold the shoulder in the, or the head humerus in the middle of the socket and you've got the right kind of strength balance between the bigger muscles, you've now got a shoulder that can work because mm. the, the intricate bits that hold it together, think about it as the chassis, is, is rock solid, and now you can go and move. If that chassis is weak, like, you've just got an opportunity for things to start to crumble. And, and that's what I think we, we, we really did on reflection as we started to explore lots of different types of calisthenics positions, and, and I've never dislocated since. Mm. Yeah, no, and yeah, bravo for that and, and good for that. And it was a look, really, though, wasn't it? Like it wasn't, it wasn't planned <laughs> out. Like it was, well, it was a thought experiment, as you, you rightly say. Yeah, but then any, any, any good thought experiments, we don't, we don't know what the answer is, but it's done off the back of a theory that's like, 
if if x y z da, da, then it should make that 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 should work and then you're testing it out um so for a lot of um for a lot of people some of the uh, or, or for all of us I'm, I'm i'm interested in what are some of the common things that you see now that people could start to think about with their with their training for so whether they're whether they're in actual like pain or whether their shoulder just doesn't feel quite right one feels a bit different to the other or just get it every now and again it feels a bit niggly in this like what are some of the common things that um that you see that people are lacking around the shoulder um and, and paired with that question is sort of a a case of a lot of the time i know when i first like got into um got into to personal training and strength conditioning and, and, and understanding anatomy it was like we'd hear the, and we'd see this on sort of youtube tutorials all the time we've got like uh this this sort of like two black and white or maybe these are two separate questions answer this one first maybe that um we hear of like retraction and depression of the scapula and then we've got protraction and elevation um and we, we'd we'd commonly hear those four things um one question is like is is that the only thing that that is going on or is there are we missing something there and i know that i would have had this years ago where you got the you heard it that many ways around that it seemed to suggest that like retraction and depression is good and <laughs> retraction elevation is bad that's where a lot of people will have um will have will have will have, maybe are still there now so is there anything else within that and then is that as i'm sort of suggesting maybe it isn't quite as black and white as good and bad yeah absolutely so we, what we're talking about with this sort of stuff is, is the scapulothoracic joint. So the, the scapula sits on top of the rib cage and is effectively held there in space by muscle. There's a little bit of ligamentous tissue at the top, which is kind of, kind of attaching onto the um, acromion process and whatnot. But ultimately, it's kind of held there by the muscles that support it. So that gives it a huge amount of movement. And, and just to kind of orientate ourselves around it, think about the scapula and the humeral head together as a glenohumeral joint. Those two things need to work in quite close synchronicity. So the scapula is effectively adjusting and reacting to movements of the hand. The shoulder's job is to position the hand. So as you start to, your brain goes, I want to reach here. The scapula's job is to keep contact with the humeral head, the little fossa on the scapula is where the little dish, that kind of teacup that I spoke about before, is trying to stay in contact with the teacup. If you want to, I love that. The the I've not thought of that. The the. And all of these like end process things of going the purpose because I th- I would have just uh, you just made me think I was like the reason my shoulder moves is because my shoulder moves but it's like no no it's you're you you're basically wanting to move your hand <laughs> yeah. The, yeah but I've not really thought of it like that you it's, you want to move your hand you don't really want to move your shoulder it's yeah. just the shoulder facilitates the hand movement because exactly. you can appreciate the the importance of the hands in everything that we do yeah but well, now we can get well later we can go a little bit maybe if you want to and go well now like what's the brain's interest mm. in that because now we become task outcome so if you like what are you trying to achieve with your hand is then the shoulder is going to facilitate that so we can then be a little bit more purposeful about stimulating central processes by thinking about what job i'm going to do with the hand to get the shoulder to then play the game yeah um so yeah that, that scalp's kind of like sat on the rib cage floating around in space held by muscles so they, have, they, they say there's like 12 cardinal movements of the scapula so we have retraction we've got protraction of the opposites and i won't go through them all because people just lose it but the major ones that often people talk about is retraction and then protraction so the scapula basically moving like laterally if you imagine that around the rib case so if you squeeze your shoulders together to try and pinch a pound coin you're in retraction if you try and reach out in front of you with your hands going at the end of like a bench press or something and really push your shoulders around that's your protraction movement You've then also got upward and downward rotation. So the scapula is going to move up and around the rib cage. That's going to be um, often found in overhead pressing movements. So if you take your hand straight overhead, we're thinking about upward rotation, bring it down, downward rotation. Abduction is where the scapula can move to the side and a deduction, it can move backwards and forward, elevation, depression, up and down. So there's, there's and then it, it tilts as well. So you've basically got this kind of yeah, you've got a, 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 a you can always a move in all pretty mobile. Can, yeah, yeah, move anywhere. It, it kind of go anywhere. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of people have heard back and down and and that retraction depression that kind of serves in some positions like a bent over row that would be a, a pretty good cue or a horizontal row and pattern. 
But if we want to go up and overhead, we need upward rotation. So we want to go up and round. That's, that, that's how the scapula is going to stay in contact with the humerus as we take our hand overhead. Otherwise, if the scap stays like locked in and down and we're trying to go overhead, we're then going to force the scapula or stop the scapula from being able to maintain that contact with the humeral head, which means that the brain will then find a different way to get the shoulder into a position where you can get mm. your hand overhead. And that could be by hiking through the upper trap to elevate it, to shift the whole thing up because we're lacking the rotation to get around. So it just find a different solution. Yeah. Like the brain's amazing at that. The problem comes if, if you've got like muscle imbalance around the shoulder, so it's not moving well. If we've got some kind of like uh, issues, which uh, I'll go into the detail of this, but around the subacromial space. So the space between the chromium process, which is like the roof of your shoulder, think of it like that, everyone, you can feel your AC joint on top of your shoulder. Um, the space between that and the humeral head, that is your subacromial space. When it's a healthy, you probably will have about a centimeter's worth of space there. If you have left, less than a centimetre, you're going to start to have some problems because you've got tendons and, and some other structures like a bursa which sits underneath that chromium process. So if your scap can't go up, for example, it can't rotate upwards, and let's say that you're kind of like a bit anterior shoulder dominant, you've got too much tension in pecs, lats, and anterior delt, your brain then goes, well, I can't get the scapula up and round, so I'm going to find a way for you to elevate a little bit in there. We're just going to bring that humeral head up underneath the acromion process, pinching the structures underneath it, and then that's what people will often call impingement. Well, it was effectively just like shoulder pain. Yeah. But we're squashing the structures because we now can't articulate the scapula into a good position, but trying to find a solution to the end outcome, which is to get into a certain position. Um, so th th to your point, that kind of all sounds quite technical, and people go, okay, I still no wiser to what I should be doing, Tim. But the point being that, we don't do enough work which is focused on or respects the design of the shoulder. So the, yeah. the tagline for dynamic shoulders, I've called it, is, is performance driven by design. We can only get performance gains if we understand and respect the design of the shoulder. And what that means is we have to start thinking about restoring and man maintaining good shoulder movement and control and then scaling it in line with what our performance objectives are going to be. So yeah. if you want to go and snatch... 100 kilos like you're going to need to make sure you've got good movement around the shoulder and it can get into a good overhead position and then can you still do that when you're starting to throw force down and and that will require upgradings of both the stability or mobility stability and strength processes in order to do that but we just go and chew away at strength-based movements and we forget that we aren't actually upgrading the stabilization system directly as part of that process yeah. Well, no, I think, and I actually think that a lot of people have heard, will be listening to that and just the concept or the idea of like, okay, there is quite a big difference in the movement when I'm going overhead compared to when I'm like, um, doing a row or something like the way my, um, the difference between the shoulder going into flexion rather than extension requires, because they're two completely different things requires quite a difference in how my shoulder blade, my scapula moves that if we've never really thought about how that, that shoulder, when we go overhead, when we press, we're doing our handstands, whatever it is that we're doing, needs to have that upward rotation and that key, that, that the way you described it is going up and around. Just the idea of getting that in your head and trying to picture it. I think for some people, just picturing that when they're doing movements will help, will help massively. So yes, you've gone and spoke technically about that, but I actually think those little, those little bits, those little snippets and those little cues there, for a lot of people will help things just feel a little little smoother yeah the, the timing gets messed up so we, i've seen a lot of shoulders where the, the, if you imagine that the, the scapula when we start to move overhead the scapula sh for the first portion of that movement say you're going to go like hand up by your side and try and get into overhead position it shouldn't move it should stay still for like about 30 degrees and then it will start to upwardly rotate what a lot of people will do is they'll just they activate through like the retraction so rhomboids and mid traps and they, the scapula pulls in towards the spine and then then after a bit it then releases mm. and then we'll move up but it won't get up to maybe the 60 degrees of, of upward rotation that we need it might hit 40 degrees for example because it's so gone like in first rather than going out yeah possibly you've not got enough strength to pull it around or the mobility but you're also going backwards when you want to be going forwards mm. so the timing is all messed out and that's not helped by this back and down cue because people go right back and down pinch it hold it and now go is that also how they have probably developed stability so it's like 
this thing's moving it's like right the first thing we do is like get it stable so they're just like yeah you know, they, they retract yeah it could yeah exactly and, and it could be that we've got say the, the part of the, the job of the lower traps is to is to be able to sort of stabilize that shoulder blade in the early portion of the movement well if it's not working properly then the mid traps and the rhomboids are probably going we've got this and it will yeah, yeah. on and then we've got to come work through so the lower trap is actually going to stabilize the shoulder during that first portion of the movement and then it assists with the upward rotation so when, when strength and conditioning coaches and, and trainers will often cue people and go, oh, we need to like, fight, engage mid-low traps, back and down. Like, yes, mid-low tra- or, or mid traps are going to be different. Mid-trap is a retractor. Lower trap is going to actually primarily, the job we want it to do is an upward rotator. It, it can obviously pull the scapula downwards a little bit based on it, like the, the line of pull. But we actually need to kind of understand that back and down is no good if we're trying to get up and round yeah. overhead yeah. so stop squeezing them down and then the other thing that people just yeah that like is that if you if you've got shoulder problems i'm going to give you one cue to take away go and do some rotator cuff work external rotation work and go and do some serrated anterior work so getting that scapula around the rib cage and there's there's lots of exercises that you can find to do those sorts of things but it will be a game changer for your handstands and any overhead movement mobility because you will auto or instantly by doing that for a period of time improve the fundamental things around the shoulder like there's two force couples that basically the, the, the basic mechanics of getting the shoulder into a good position is rotator cuff and upward rotation of the scapula do those things and you're going to have more success than you're probably already having and you may well clear away some pain yeah yeah i always um i know you've done you've done this a few times with um people that you're working with um but also people could do it we talk about this for um when you're trying to understand what's going, maybe do some problem solving on yourself with with your handstand or with your human flag or things that you're working on training wise, but even just videoing yourself with, mm. you know, if you have like with your shirt off, so you can, and, and, and at your back, so you can actually see your own scapula moving on yourself as you take your arms through different movements. I think Pete, like I, it, it's it is fascinating if you if you are into if you're into your training, you want to understand what's going on, like videoing yourself and and not doing any just literally moving your arms and just see how it see see from behind how it's what's actually moving um i think is is helpful for sure yeah and then you then you start this is where the shoulders are maybe a little bit different to maybe some other joints in the body that we, we try and program for is you have to start peeling layers back like it's, it's, mm. it's difficult to fix it and go that is the absolute thing because we change it and then there's all these other kind of ways the shoulder can move and it might then kind of like throw something else up but the, the awareness of what you're doing with your shoulders is actually like we don't yeah. we don't know it because I, if we're in the two we're changing mirrors and we're doing some lower body stuff i can see my my foot knee and ankle yeah uh, sorry foot knee and hip when i'm when i'm squatting if I'm pressing overhead, I can't see my shoulders, so I can't correct it. Yeah, so yeah. some people are like scapula winging off the back of the ribcage. It looks like a stegosaurus. They got, they're like, oh, it feels fine. Well, it's a bit painful, but like, I don't think yeah. it's a problem. And all of a sudden, you're like, crikey, we've not yeah. got no contact with the scap on the ribcage, which is an issue. Well, I think um, the flip side, though, if by, by videoing your back when you're doing something with your shirt off so you can see what's moving, you will actually see it. But mm. then, whereas if I video, if I, you know, did a naked move, I, I looked at my ass with a video without any <laughs> pants on, like, yeah, it'd be nice. But, <laughs> and I move my leg around, I'm barely going to see anything other than my leg moving, which I could see if I had my tracksuit bottoms on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's actually, um, it reveals quite a lot. Um, and it is fascinating to see what's, what's moving about. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Particularly, I think also of like those that are like well into their like training and their anatomy and stuff like you, what you see in a textbook and then what you see on your actual body can be a little bit like different, a bit yeah. like, oh, is that actually, is, is that my upper trap? Like it looks a bit, it doesn't look like the picture on the, the nice picture in the, uh, in the textbook. And, and it takes a little bit of fixing because they're changing your kinesthetic awareness of, of how you're moving with your shoulder is hard. Like it's, it takes a little bit of time. And this is probably to one of the points you alluded to before is that we become so much about intensity at the moment around training. And if you're not training hard and, and absolutely like in all, and this is kind of like spread across many different areas of training. Um, I think we're losing the mindfulness of it. And, and in as particularly in sort of like, I'm going to call it a general population. I don't mean that at all disrespectfully, but in contrast to an athlete's program, where who's in a professional environment where they've got a strength and conditioning coach, 
like we are able to completely control and dictate the pace, content, progression of a training program. Whereas a lot of people now are going to train and there's a culture of, I need to train hard. Mm -hmm. So we don't spend the time necessary on ourselves um, taking a little bit of responsibility for some of this sort of stuff like we kind of push it hard until we get injured and then we end up either compromised to a point where we kind of like have to take a week off or i can't train that movement worst case scenario i've got to be so bad that i go to a physiotherapist but with shoulders what you'll find is if you can't imagine a continuum where you've got like injured at one end and then the other end of the spectrum you've got like full progression like getting after it in the middle you've kind of got niggling and compromised which is where most people find mm. themselves i've got a shoulder niggle it's not bad enough to go to a physio yeah but it's not good enough that i can actually go and start to, to push things on and people kind of surf that line between kind of getting a little bit better than getting a little bit worse um and uh, there's just not a lot of uh, training at the moment doesn't contain a lot of stuff which is actually really good fit for people's shoulders in terms of the progressive approach to building that dynamic stability that i talked about before it takes a little bit of care because it's such a fine balance of getting it mm. right you want to get to the stage where i'm at now where like i've done enough of that kind of work where i actually have got good shoulder mechanics so my my upward rotation is good like i don't have any pain i've got full range of motion um i can control through like concentric eccentric patterns so now what happens when i go and train instability movements or dynamic stability movements on things like the rings my shoulders are getting the doses of what they need because mm. i train well and move well based on the system that's kind of well primed yeah if i don't have those things I'm missing a piece if I then go and try and... So I don't need to do yeah. a lot of corrective work. I don't yeah. do a lot, but I do just... But because training in a certain way, using certain types of exercises, maintains it for me. That's where I want to get people to. And then I can go and do whatever else it is I want to do. Yeah. Now, I guess that if um, someone could go, oh, like seeing like the, you know, I know you really like the, the pipe push-ups on the rings with your feet elevated and, and go and see that and go, that's a great exercise to do. But if doing that with poor mechanics just means you're going to be upgrading the system of your dysfunction. You'll just get even better at being dysfunctional or, or it will just be more painful. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like understanding the, yeah, understanding the where you need to get to first before it's not necessarily, or what I'm hearing is it's yes, there are good exercises to do that are going to help, but it's about you being able to understand those movements and feel those movements before we worry about, actually doing something that's going to make it stronger there's no point in getting stronger in the dysfunction that you're already at yeah and, and this is where i think like going back to our, our, the first thing we spoke about i have a theory that the shoulder given the right environments will self-organize so i didn't do loads mm. of external band rotation work when we started calisthenics what i did was started to kind of change and play around with just different things in different positions which were promoting Good quality movement now bear in mind i come into this off the back of quite a lot of physio work so i've probably done a fair amount mm. of that work as it as it was but if we if we create the conditions for better quality movement and we we're consistent and disciplined with that we have to respect in my mind and this is where we can get a little bit kind of like maybe new age but like we have to respect that the body will adapt to the stress that we place on it so if I'm constantly challenging dynamic stability in progressively more and difficult um, overhead pressing patterns, okay, if I've got chronic tightness in the rhomboids, which is sticking the scapula back towards the ribcage, I might need to do something about that. So I might do some, some release work. But if I'm just constantly doing something which is promoting a little bit more external rotation kind of work or the, the need for the rotator cuff to suck the humeral head into the fossa, or I'm doing some stuff which is creating upward rotation, and I'm training eccentrically. This is another great thing about calisthenics or, or, or for the shoulder is that you, you go and take a, um, an Olympic weightlifting or CrossFit environment. The amount of eccentric control that the shoulder does is like minimal. We throw a bar, we drop it back onto the shoulder. Mm. We throw a bar, we're not actually decelerating weight. Now, that's a huge issue for controlling the scapular mechanics as we come mm. back from an overhead position and getting ready in a good position to then go and press mm. again. Every time we're kind of like coming down, we haven't got control. So I'm pressing now from a poor position rather than coming down in a handstand yeah. kind of a pipe push up position, entering a good shape, plus all the benefits of the, the, the environment. And we stay away from the details of, of what we term as closed kinetic chain, but having your hands fixed creates the conditions for 
like promoting stability and control um we just start to kind of like will the shoulder just find a solution will the brain find a solution activate the, the muscles better because it's trying to find a solution to instability for example um because we see it like you, you stick someone up on a set of rings and you go like do a front support you just like learning ring dip do a front support the first time they do it they're going to be all mm -hmm. over the place and then they come back in and a week later after practicing and they actually can hold it pretty still now what's happened there the brain's gone well, I need to press some different buttons if I'm going to get this joint to stabilize. I'm going to use these things instead because those other ones weren't working very well because I'm risking the structure integrity mm. by the shoulder kind of diving around all over the place. So I am, I am kind of like what I don't want to do with this kind of journey into kind of analyzing and understanding the shoulder more is go, it's all about band external rotations, people, because that's flipping boring and people don't do it. So can we do a little bit of that? Because that is going to protect the mechanics of the shoulder. But ultimately, can you go to a place where we're doing maybe weighted vest ring push-ups, like just horizontal push patterns? That's probably better than the bench press. It's flipping difficult. Um, and it's probably arguably better for the shoulder because you're constantly having to readjust and re reactively stabilize the joint, mm. which is what the shoulder wants um, from, from a performance perspective. And then what does that do? for your bench press if that's what you want to do or your like strength-based movements wherever you want to go because you've upgraded the stabilization system so the brain goes with the joints more stable i can let you have a little bit more force yeah no definitely um well it's uh i'm sure there'll be people that are uh listening to this and going yeah like i that that, that group that you um said like sat in that middle portion where it's like okay i'm not necessarily going to go to a physio and I haven't done actually I've, 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 no, I've known for the last two years and my shoulder has been a bit like not a bit gritty mm. and it's holding me back a bit but not enough to um yeah go go into uh, go into a physio or I certainly don't need surgery or anything like extreme like that but I would like to I would like to try and sort it out I would like to have a few things in my program that's gonna that's gonna help with that um where do people where can people sort of um get assistance and, and help with that Timbo? So you can find us at dynamicshoulders.com um, and it's dynamic shoulders on social as well. Um, we are doing some, or we, I, I say we, it's Cara and my wife and I are, are, are teaming up on this one. Um, so she does all the, 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 she does all the nuts and bolts and then she basically pimps me out is how it's working at the moment. <laughs> she sends me out to work. Um, so we're doing some online um, coaching so you can get, you could do full shoulder analysis and then we write the programs and it's kind of touch base via an app. Um, it's an education program as well. So if you're a coach or practitioner in the industry that wants to learn more about this sort of stuff from a strength and conditioning progressive perspective it's not a rehabilitation physio course it's going to be more about how we help strength and fitness coaches to get their clients pain-free give them some more stability in their shoulders help them to get more confident so if you've got if you yourself or you know anybody who's struggling with those kind of issues of pain, instability, lack of confidence, um, then have a look at the education course and we've actually got a webinar on the 15th of December which you can register for. It's free and you can come and find out a little bit more about what we're doing from an education perspective. Great stuff. Well, uh, we will, uh, we'll put the links in the show notes to all of those things. And, um, yeah, if, uh, let's say if, if you, if you only do anything is like that, uh, get, get a bit more of a deep dive in that webinar for sure. Perfect. So that's been useful. I, I, waxing local, I get, I'm quite into this stuff at the moment. So it's, <laughs> it's a little bit of a download, yeah, but I good. hope it made sense. And let me know if you've got any questions. Yeah, thank you everybody for for listening and um just to remind you uh, as well that if you are into your body weight training we have the uh six weeks body weight basics starting on the 11th of january places are limited or you start to book up you get a discount if you're a member 125 quid if you're not a member but it's lifetime access to the live sessions watch them back on replay and all of the tutorials and workouts in there for each week as well so if you are a member of scorecast since you've got online membership with us in the dashboard is your code to get your discounted rate of 99 pounds if you're a vip member it's all hidden and, and hush hush you've got a personal email from me about about getting it for just 75 quid so check out uh your check out the email and if you are a vip member 
and you were like, oh, I can't find it, but I really want to get involved, email me. Day, uh, Jack, uh, what's my email address? David at schoolgazettes.com. We should have changed it to Jacko years ago. No, no, no. Um, there's definitely some stuff in that course as well, guys, that is going to be really good for your shoulder health. So there's some of the stuff that we started off on, using the rings, getting mm. balancing on the floor, hanging from bars, that's exactly where we started. Um, and that my kind of shoulder rehabilitation or progressive rehabilitation program started. So if you have got some kind of stuff you want to do your shoulders, you're going to need to get some stability you're going to need to get some core training you need to get your pelvis talking to your spine and your um, shoulders and all of that is including body weight basics so it, it could be a really interesting place to start and see, dip your toe in the water of calisthenics and progressive body weight shoulder rehabilitation type work yeah that's actually a good point i didn't uh, i haven't said that it is it's full body the body weight basics it's not yeah. just a body it's everything um great stuff um and i believe if i've got this right we're come it's not that long until christmas so i hope everybody is feeling very festive and getting in the mood and uh we will see you uh next time for a little bit of christmas festivities if that's christmas easy that's, that's, cheer. bring your bring, bring, bring your sherry jacko bring bring, bring <laughs> your santa hat and your elf socks cherry um, and a mince pie uh yeah and then also look out for uh look out for the christmas new year uh excitement that's potentially mm. going to start on boxing day so keep an eye out for that people that's a little bit of a uh a teaser uh or something to keep your eyes out for can i sign us off you go for it timbo uh, keep exploring your physical potential with movement strength and play class dismissed